Good morning, Professor Oskay Sanditon, and welcome to this virtual hall of the Rafael del Pino Foundation. It's an honor to have you with us today as uh, our guest speakers. Your examination of capitalism in the 21st century is very compelling and needs to be shared with, with others. Congratulations on your new book. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. We're delighted to, to be, be here. here. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. I wish we could do it in person. Yeah, now. we so wish we could be with you. Um, I, I will be doing the presentation and then Angus will be um, uh, fielding the first set of questions. Uh, so we're going to talk about our new book uh, published by Princeton University Press. And it grew out of a body of work that we've been working on for the last five years. All fund, some of it funded through the National Institutes of Health in the US. Um, just an overview of the book, that even before the arrival of COVID, the lives of Americans without a four-year college degree, uh, their lives were coming apart. And that's two thirds of the population in the US between the ages of 25 and the 64. So that's a large group of people. And in the book, what we do is document what that means in terms of despair and excess mortality. And then we discuss what we think are the long run forces behind this. Um, but to, just to give you a sense of how stunning a change we saw, um, we want to take you back in time. If you look at the mortality rates of men and women ages 45 to 54, these are white men and women in this particular graph, um, how did their mortality change between 1900 and 2000? And these rates are deaths per 100,000 people at risk. So you can just think of this at the, as the risk of dying in any particular year. And you can see that that fell from about 1,500 per 100,000 back in 1900, all the way down to 400 per 100,000 by the end of the century. Here's the 1918 flu epidemic, which is the last big pandemic before COVID. Um, we thought this progress that we saw would continue and if we look at other rich countries and other English speaking countries, uh, we found that going into the 21st century, the progress did continue. Um, other English speaking countries, Canada, the UK, Ireland, and then other uh, wealthy countries in Europe. But in the US, that things changed. Um, among whites in the US, who were keeping uh, company with Germany until the late 1990s, uh, their mortality rates started to rise. Hispanics in the US saw mortality rates fall very much like the Brits, like those in the UK. For black Americans, their mortality rates are higher than whites. They continue to be higher than whites, but their mortality rates were falling at an even faster rate than what you see here for other groups. And this is about 2% per year decline in mortality. Now, what happened here? Um, and does it matter? Well, it's a big enough uh, problem that life expectancy in the US fell for three years straight. And that hadn't happened since World War I and that 1918 flu epidemic. And the decline in life expectancy was being driven by what we saw happening to people in prime age, 25 to 64. Now, some of that is due to the fact that one of the big engines for progress, which was heart disease progress, um, our declines in heart disease mortality um, uh, stopped falling and they started to flatten out 
so that this big engine for progress uh, stopped working in the US. But the other thing that we found that happened was that there were three causes of death that were rising, um, drug overdose, suicide, alcoholic liver disease. Uh, this is for one group, I'll show you other groups in a minute, but for 40 to 50 to 54 year old whites. And I've divided these up between those with less than a four year college degree and people with a college degree or more. And you can see there's a small increase among people with a college degree for drug overdose, much less um, for suicide or for alcohol. But what you see is that the divide is really between those who have gone to college and those who have not. And um, education is on the death certificate in the US. We don't have income on the death certificate or occupation, but we do have education, which is why we started with education. And we found throughout our work, throughout the book, that education, a four-year college degree, is a very meaningful dividing line between people whose lives are going well and people whose lives are not. Um, in much of this work, we put these three causes of death together. And as a shorthand, we started calling them deaths of despair. They have quite a lot of in common in the sense that it's all death by one's own hand. Um, and they all show, we believe, quite a lot of despair. Um, if you look across every five-year age group over the period that we have data, 1992 to 2018, we can see this rise taking place. And it's even beginning to move into the elderly. So that in 2017, in 2018, 158,000 Americans died from suicide drugs or alcohol. Um, now that's not as many as have died this year from COVID, but it gives you a sense that this is a very big problem. And we're, what we fear is that long after there's a vaccine for COVID or treatments for COVID, there won't be a vaccine for drug, alcohol, or suicide mortality. Um, if you take, instead of looking by age, 25 to 29 year olds or 60 to 64 year olds, if instead you look at uh, the risk of dying based on the year that you were born, what we find is that people born in 1940 have a low and fairly constant risk with age over the period that we have data. And the same is true for people born in 1945. But by the time you get to people born in 1950, at any given age, they have a, a higher risk of dying from drugs, alcohol, or suicide. And then a higher risk still for the people born in 1955, and then for 1960, and then for 1965. So you can see that for people in their late 40s, um, the difference between what it was true for people born in 1945 and people born in 1970 is a really large difference. That this isn't also just about what's happening to the baby boomers, what we call the people who are born in the very large cohorts after the Second World War. This is actually worse the later you were born. Um, that was for people without a bachelor's degree, without a four-year college degree. If you compare that to people with a bachelor's degree, you can see that they look like they live in different universes. There's a small increase here for the cohorts born in 1980 and 85 for people with a four-year college degree, but it's just nothing relative to the risks that are being faced by people without a four-year college degree. Um, that, that realization took us to Durkheim, who wrote about suicide in 1897, and his work continues to stand as kind of the pillars of how people think about suicide, that he posited that suicide 
um, was due to a lack of social integration or social regulation, and that it's more likely at times of great upheaval. Now, who do we know? What do we know about the people who are dying? It's geographically very widespread in the US. Every US six state saw increases in all three causes of death between 2000 and 2018. We also know it's happening to men and to women. So if you take just one birth cohort the, or one age group, the other age groups look like this, you can see that without a college degree for men and women, the increases have been almost identical, um, although men start at a higher level of death from all three causes. Whereas for men and women with a bachelor's degree, there's been almost no change. Um, where can you find the financial crisis of 2008 in these increases? We thought that we might find that these increases in death, we could pin to um, increasing unemployment or current incomes in the household. And that's what we went looking for, but we didn't find it. What we found was that we think it's something about the economy, but something that started much earlier um, and that's much deeper. Um, underneath, these mortality counts, we document in the book that among people without a four-year college degree, there have been increases in pain year on year on year and increases in social isolation, poor mental health as well. Um, now pain is self-reported, social isolation and mental health questions asked in surveys are also self-reported. Because they're self-reported, some people found those easier to dismiss. But when you combine the increases in pain with the increases in mortality, it all fits into a bigger picture. Um, what do we think are the roots of this? We think a lot of it has to do with a long-term decline in the labor market for people who haven't been to college. If you look for men ages 25 to 54, with less than a four-year college degree, and you look at their median wages, this is the 50% mark of wages, what you find is that there's been a long-term de decline in the wages for working class men. It goes up and down a little bit with the business cycle, but um, the, the trend has been down, 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 so that in 2019, uh, these men were earning substantially less than would have been the case in 1980. Their attachment to the labor market has also changed. If you look at the, the number employed relative to the population, with recessions, which are these red lines, people lose their jobs, they come back into the labor market, there's another recession, they lose more jobs, but every time they come back into the labor market, they never reach as high an employment to population ratio as they had had in the previous uh, round. Um, so given that employment is declining and wages are declining, we take that as a sign that the demand for less skilled workers has changed, that it has shifted in, that has moved against these workers. There's little wage change within a job, but when you lose a job, um, we think loss of wages and lower participation come from replacing those jobs with worse jobs, with jobs that have been outsourced to transport companies, security companies, food services, where there's much less commitment by either the employers or the employees. And it's harder to see those jobs as being part of the good life. Um, even low-skilled workers had a sense of belonging to large firms. But if you look at Amazon, for example, in their fulfillment centers, their warehouses, um, there are some Amazon employees, but the majority are from this outsourced company called in in Integrity Staffing Solutions. The people here have much less job security 
they're, um, they have much fewer benefits. Um, we see this less as a loss of, of material well-being and more a loss of meaning and status. Marriage is declined over this period for people without a, a four-year degree, not for people with a BA. Um, uh, the number of children born to parents without, uh, outside of marriage increased, increased, increased for this group. And they felt the loss of community as well. So there's less stability at work. There's less stability at home. There's less stability in the community. So we think Durkheim would say this is a recipe for suicide. And in the book, we argue that this parallels some of what we saw in the African-American community in the US in the late 1960s and in the 1970s. Um, now, other countries have faced globalization and automation, but they haven't seen their deaths of despair increase. So what's different about the US? One thing is the opioid epidemic that we argue in the book that drug and alcohol and suicide mortality was rising before the arrival of OxyContin, which is one and a half times stronger than morphine, and that was started to be distributed by doctors around the country. Any doctor with a script could write you a prescription for heroin in pill form. Um, but the, the fact that that had happened, that we unleashed all these opioids made the crisis much more horrific than it needed to be. And we argue though that the opioids landed on people who were looking for something to help them numb the pain of what they were going through with life and that the pharma companies targeted that despair. What else is different about the US? The US has the most expensive healthcare in the world, but on many metrics, Americans have the worst health in the rich world. We argue that life expectancy fell in the US, not in spite of what we spend on healthcare, but because of what we spend on healthcare. And if you compare the US to other rich countries, if you look at healthcare expenditure per person against life expectancy at birth, from 1970 to 2015 for the UK, for Australia, for Canada. So, so costs are rising, but so is life expectancy at birth. France, Switzerland, which is the next most expensive country relative to the US. And then here's the US coming in 1970 to 82, 1982 to 1990 and out to 2015. So the US is just an outlier in spending so much on healthcare. Um, it's almost $1 and five that the US spends on healthcare. Switzerland is the next highest at 12.4%. Uh, the Swiss live five years longer than Americans. The difference in spending between the US and Switzerland is over 5%, which is more than a trillion dollars a year. That's more than $8,300 a household. And that's just the excess spending. It's half again as much as the US spends on the military. This comes from somewhere. This has to come from wages or profits or taxes. In the US, we crazily, a tie health insurance to employers. And many people think that their employer provided health care insurance as a gift. But that gift is coming out in part or in whole from what would be their paycheck. Um, we think that the lower wages among working class people uh, can be um, matched to the increases in health care costs that their employer has to pay to, um, uh, to provide them health insurance. A family of four health insurance premia are now $21,000 a year. The firm pays their share of it, about 71%. That is so expensive that firms decide to outsource low wage jobs. Um, the premia don't vary by how much workers earn. So it's like a poll tax. It's a fixed cost for hiring this worker. So it's a, in a sense, it's like 
the minimum wage where there's been a lot of discussion, but there's been very little discussion on what this kind of health insurance premium does to low wage work. We think that financing healthcare this way takes a wrecking ball to the low skilled labor market. The US states have to pay for health insurance for people who are too poor um, to be able to pay for their own. But because the states have to pay for their share of Medicaid, which is health insurance for the poor, they don't have money left for schools, for universities, for infrastructure. Uh, so state spending has gone up and up and up on, on healthcare as well. So what do we do with all of this? In the book, we talk about the future of capitalism, not the failure of capitalism. We think it needs to be fixed. It needs to be put back up on the rails. And we think healthcare reform is central in this and that that is just a, uh, an injury the US is inflicting upon itself. Maybe the COVID crisis might give us a chance to do that when so many people will suddenly have pre-existing conditions, uh, 10 million people so far in the US having had COVID who might find it difficult to get health insurance uh, because they now have this pre-existing condition. And the hundreds of thousands of people who have medical bills they probably will not be able to pay. Maybe when that happens, there's going to be a real push for health um, care uh, spending change. More generally though, uh, we think that corporate lobbying and the decline of unions have left less educated workers with very little representation in Washington. And as the saying goes in the US, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So we'll leave it there and um, we'll come back and Angus is going to take the first shot at answering questions. Or at least I'm gonna start. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, well, thank you, thank you, Professor Case, Professor Ditton, very much. You know, we all have enjoyed a stimulating lecture on the future of capitalism, how we can return to a path of rising prosperity and, and health. We have a lot of questions from our audience. Uh, we would appreciate that you answer a selection of questions. No? So let's start now a brief question and answer session. Uh, the, the first question, in your book, you paint a troubling portrait of the American dream in decline, but we all share the American dream, uh, the conviction that social mobility is important and everyone should have a fair chance of improving one's life uh, as a guide only the United States is deeply rooted in Europe and the majority of countries as well. Our societies have undergone an unprecedented collapse in social uh, capital, especially the US, according to Professor Putnam, with serious negative uh, consequences. How could we strengthen civil society and what will be the future trends in social mobility, according to your, your point of view? Would you boost public investment, uh, particularly in health and education, to enhance the quality of opportunities? Yeah, these are big questions. And if we knew the answer to that, we probably wouldn't be writing a book. If we, uh, you know, running for public office or something. And, uh, but there are certain things that are pretty clear. I mean, and some of it's specifically American and some of it's more general than that. But I mean, the big division here, when you say equality of opportunity, um, for people who don't have a four-year degree in America, uh, capitalism is not really delivering very well for them or indeed for their children. Um, so I don't think in most European countries that line is quite so sharp. Um, and it's certainly not in Britain, which I know best, and not in Germany or Holland and so on. So we created this um, sort of meritocracy, a pretend meritocracy, in, or it is maybe a meritocracy, but only a small fraction of people succeed. And then it stops being a true meritocracy because the people who succeed sort of pull up the ladders behind them and make it very difficult for the next generation to succeed. Um, so the, those are issues. We Healthcare and education um, are clearly largely the responsibility of the state um, or should be. And the, the lack of public healthcare in the United States is, is a real scandal. 
it's unique among um, rich countries. Um, it's the only country that funds its healthcare um, this way. And we think that's, as Anne explained in the slides, not only is spending colossal sums of money on it, but we're not getting much return for that. And we're making it, we're stifling equality of opportunity um, because the entry level jobs in good corporations um, really aren't there anymore. So this enormous cost of healthcare is sitting like an enormous insect <laughs> sort of on top um, of the economy. Um, and that's much more an American phenomenon. And, and we tend to think that, you know, that's the reason why these things are so much worse in America um, than they are in European countries. Um, that said, um, the education is also very important. Um, the cost of healthcare is, is making education more difficult too. And, um, you know, when we've made this education the big dividing line, but two thirds of the population. And the prestige and a dignified work um, without necessarily having to jump over this one hurdle. So that would be a set of reforms that I think would be useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would just add one thing I didn't mention is that it, um, some of the civil society institutions have sort of crumbled in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., uh, organized religion has always been an incredibly important institution. For 200 years, it was incredibly important. Among white working class, younger adults, less than half of them affiliate with any church whatsoever. So that means they're also not tethered to a place where they might find solace or might find um, some support. And that's been important in a way that's not being much reported in the press. Um, the press likes to say that evangelicals have still stuck with Donald Trump. Well, that's true, but a lot of young people have stopped being evangelical. So, you know, they're, they're voting with their feet rather than at the ballot box. So that's been so important. So that was one. Story. And the other thing is that I think that when people have a living wage, when people feel they can hold body and soul together, they're just much more likely to participate in local clubs, the kinds of clubs that like my father would have belonged to, you know, for working class guys who got together and they built pavilions and they, you know, they, they provided a place for everyone to come and enjoy the sense of a village. So I think those things may come back if we give people a, sense, a better sense of dignity or a better sense that, that their, their work matters and that they matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. How important it is to have a shared project no? in, in our nations. No? Well, thank you, Professor. But it, in the book, you suggest that the hopelessness uh, that these workers uh, are experiencing uh, may eventually extend to the entire American workforce. You know, they just stop the process and, and to avoid this extension. The key question is how, how can be done? Uh, a follower of Professor Milanovic, Maria Martinez, asks you, what are the reforms for the dysfunctions of capitalism uh, you propose? Would you include the concentrating capital and wealth ownership through tax advantages to give the middle class a bigger stake in financial capital? Well, maybe, but I think there's a lot of things you can do before that. So there are a lot of really bad things going on that are not an inherent part of capitalism at all, like the enormous amount of lobbying that's going on, for instance. And so you get corporations like Alphabet and Google you know, who used to resist any form of lobbying, they said, you know, we're the great technological giants, all we do is we do good, we don't need to have a presence in Washington. And now they're the biggest presence in Washington, the biggest lobbyist in Washington. And this is a, a process that's happened over and over again. The, the, the great inventors, the makers of one generation, turn into the takers in the next generation when they try to block progress. So somehow we've got to stop that invidious influence. Some of it's through campaign finance reform. Some of it's through not understanding, I think, what enormous influence um, capitalism has um, 
in Washington, these big firms have in Washington, for instance. I mean, the other thing that Anne talked about, but it's very, very important, is these pharmaceutical companies who were making opioids were allowed to kill tens of thousands of people to make enormous sums of money. I mean, one family, the Sacklers, by all accounts, made something like 12 to $13 billion of personal mm -hmm. profit out of addicting people and killing people. Now, you might say, how could that happen? Well, it happened because they had a huge amount of political protection including by the representatives of the people they were poisoning. And those people blocked attempts to prosecute them. Um, they talked, blocked uh, uh, you know, attempts to keep them under any sort of control. And once again, you know, um, <laughs> European countries didn't do this. They, they didn't allow people, you know, legalized sales of heroin to be pumped out into the general population in enormous amounts. So, you know, let's get rid of those things, which are just the horrible things, the things that are really, really hurting us first. And then we can worry about these broader things like um, whether we need to have, you know, higher taxes on capital and so on. But just to say one more thing about that, I mean, in terms of, you know, the ownership of capital and so on, you know, I quote something I think Larry Summers has been saying for a while, which is, you know, before you worry about having stakeholder capitalism, how about getting those companies to actually pay some taxes? You know, and hardly paying any taxes. So once again, I think our primary thrust is let's enforce the rules we've got now. You don't have to pull down the whole system. And the system is corrupt around the edges. And those corruption around the edges is causing great harm. So let's get rid of that first. Can I, I just wanted to add, like it would be hard to underestimate the extent to which the healthcare industry is pushing money up the distribution. So physicians are the largest occupation in the top 1% in the US. And that's largely because they're allowed to hold down the number of spots in medical schools, which means the supply is held in to keep the wages up. So um, if we could do, and hospitals are merging, and instead of that lowering prices because there are synergies, prices go up because they have more monopoly power. Okay. So, I mean, the healthcare industry itself is pushing money up the distribution. If we could stop that from happening, we'd also see then, uh, I think um, that the, the distribution would um, move more toward the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the third question is linked with, with your last comment. No? We have different questions on um, uh, market failure versus state failure, but uh, especially about what kind of capitalism are you referring in, in, in your book? Rafael Montero asks you if an economy overregulated with insufficient levels of competition, weakening position of labor and growing market power of the corporations of the new economy, especially, can really be named as capitalism. Would the measures that you propose be realistic is Question of Rafael Montero. Uh, uh, would, you, would the measures that you propose be realistic given the strong influence of the statu quo, the diverse powerful groups of interest interacting in our societies, political, economic, social? I think we could do better than we're doing. Um, so I'm not sure I heard all of the question, but just to take a particular point, one of the reasons we like to talk about rent seeking. I don't think Anne actually used the phrase, but all this lobbying, all this influence, all this doctors being allowed to set their own salaries, um, all that sort of thing, that's rent seeking. And one of the reasons we like to use that term is because there's some chance of building a coalition on both the right and the left, because the right really hate rent seeking too. The right would like to see a more competitive capitalism. Um, the left hates rent seeking too, because they think of it as sort of fat cats um, stealing from the rest of us. So we've been pushing that, and maybe, maybe we're a little too optimistic that you could actually build bridges um, between people who are deeply suspicious of capitalism and people um, who, you know, I would like to see replaced and, and people who really think capitalism is the answer. You know, let's get rid of the rent seeking. Let's get rid of this upward redistribution from everyone to a few rich people. And then let's see where we are. And maybe at that point, 
um, you need to um, do deeper reforms. But obviously, there are issues like big tech, which have become incredibly powerful um, and you know, have brought great benefits too. So there's a lot of controversy about how they should be regulated. And I think that's an intellectual task. Um, and for legal scholars, uh, philosophers, you know, political philosophers and economists in, in thinking about how those animals ought to be regulated. Um, but you know, it was done once before. We had a Gilded Age 100 years ago and the thing was brought under control. And I think we can do that again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, some of your reviewers uh, mentioned that this book explains America to its soul. But what about the rest of the world? Are we showing the same dynamics in Europe as well? In, uh, is this a global reality? The question of this It's a really, really good question. And we've thought about that a bit too. We, we wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs um, uh, about exactly that question, which is, you know, is this a peculiarly American disease that only affects and corrupts the American economy or are other countries at risk from it too? And we spent quite a lot of time looking for evidence of guts of despair in other countries. You know, are we seeing some of the things in Britain, for instance, are we seeing some of the things in Sweden? And the answer is, you know, just in terms of looking for these deaths, um, you find some of them on a much smaller scale in Britain. In Scotland, where I grew up, there's a drug epidemic that's almost as severe um, as the one in the US. Um, but, you know, you go to Germany, there are no deaths of despair in Germany, for instance. Um, so I, but that's a sort of empirical answer. <laughs> what about the mechanisms? You know, is, is Europe or other countries at risk? Well, <laughs> some of the forces are common and some of them are different. So that the healthcare issue and the opioids is a peculiarly American problem. And other countries don't have that problem to anything like the same degree. Um, which is not to say that all rich countries are not in danger from illegal drugs like fentanyl and so on. Um, you also have much better social, much more complete um, social safety nets than we have in the US. So when things are broken, you're much more likely to be taken care of. So for instance, in Britain, where um, at the bottom, um, median wages um, or even um, ordinary, you know, median wages, not just at the bottom, median wages have been stagnant um, for about 12 or 13 years now. Um, and people, higher, higher wages have been doing very well. When you look at after tax incomes, that has not happened at all. Whereas in the US, no such thing has happened. So there's a really effective safety net. You have a uh, value added taxes throughout Europe, which can be used to hold together the safety net. I think that has helped preserve Europe. But the forces of globalization, the forces of automation are absolutely common. And there's a real threat to lower class, lower skilled workers in all rich countries in the world. And so that, and I think the truth is that Europe is dealing with it better than America. You know, our friend Danny Roderick has written about this, that with trade, economists like to think that, um, you know, there are winners from trade and losers from trade, but the winners could, um, like, redistribute toward the people who have lost. And, and that's a policy decision. That's a political decision. In the U.S., that's just not happening. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. But it hasn't happened. And we think that is partly responsible for what we're seeing as well. Thank you. Well, and then the last question. Uh, in, in order to finish with an optimistic message, uh, Eva Medina asked you that the last Davos Forum meeting in January provided much attention to the concept of uh, stakeholder capitalism or the need for business to focus on the interest of all constituents. Uh, as opposed to the shareholder approach. The capability of capitalism to adapt its fundamentals to new environments has been demonstrated all along history. It is not true that, that something is changing actually at the core of, of the capitalist system. Maybe. Um, I, I think some reforms could usefully be um, put into place here. So that 
um, you know, Germany has worker representatives on corporate boards, for instance, mm -hmm. and that seems to work well there. And the evidence on that is pretty positive. And I think that could be tried much more extensively. Um, the other thing that's happened is the unions, especially in the private sector, have become much less important. Um, lots of people have different views <laughs> about unions. I mean, I grew up in Britain at a time when unions were not widely liked and seemed to be abusing their power. But there's no doubt at all that, that unions helped um, make firms more responsive to their workers. Um, they increased the wages for union members and also for non-union members. They also helped look after the um, you know, health and safety of the workers. So if there were safety violations in the factory, the unions were likely to police it and make it happen. So a lot of that's been lost. Also in many towns, the unions were the center of social capital. So you've talked about our friend Bob Putnam and you know, Bob's guy who's bowling alone is bowling in a union hall, you know? So it's not just the guy who's gone, it's the union um, that's gone. So I think, for instance, in the US, there's been a huge amount of political persecution of unions, um, passing anti-union legislation, laws that make it more difficult for people to unionize, um, the um, undermining of the process um, that allows unions to conduct elections fairly and so on. So I would start with that. Um, I would also start, um, you know, one of the places in which I think we would agree with um, Piketty and Sayas and Gabriel Zuckman is, you know, let's get something to stop these international tax havens, which are stopping these firms paying their social contribution at all. So, you know, we have corporate taxes and large firms don't pay them. So, you know, they move around their capital to places where it does get taxed. And so, you know, there's a very direct contribution before you start saying, well, you know, you have a responsibility to society. How about paying your taxes? You know, that seems like a really important first step. And we're allowing companies um, not to do that. So those are the reforms that I would start with. We're probably more incrementalists than people who want to, you know, change the whole world. Um, but these seem like common sense reforms that it could get a wide, uh, you know, a wide support um, right across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Well, so thank you very much, Professor Case and, and Deaton. We would like again to express our gratitude to you for having accepted the invitation of the Rafael Delfino Foundation and Deusto. Uh, we also would like to thank your publisher, Royal Domingo at Deusto for helping us making this stimulating and encouraging discussion possible. We appreciate the special effort that you have made to be here uh, with us uh, today. And, and we have no doubt that uh, the Spanish edition of your book will be as successful as the English version. Uh, thank you both very much. Thank you. Could you hold up the book again, please? I don't we think we've seen, seen we, we haven't have seen the Spanish, Spanish version. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. You can see, you can see both. The, yeah. Uh, the yeah. American yeah. and the Spanish. It's All very, right. very well, good. Thank you. And thank you for helping us um, tell people in Spain about the book. Yeah, and, and we I hope we can come and see you in person. Oh yes, we, we have to see you. I we know that you visit Spain very often with uh, well, some friends, multiple friends that we have also. Uh, yes. And, you know, yes. We've had many fine meals with Leandro in, in, in Madrid and, we, we, um, and Blanca, yes. So we, we'll come back as soon as we can. Okay, so we'll we get the vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> at, at, at the foundation and save. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.